And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and its rider's name was Death, and Hades followed him. And they were given authority over a fourth of the earth, to kill with sword, and with famine, and with pestilence, and by wild beasts of the earth. There's something strange about the coronavirus outbreak and the way it's currently spreading around the world like an uncontrolled wildfire. We all know that reality is not what it seems, and oftentimes, the truth ends up getting buried under a mountain of lies. You see, this outbreak of the coronavirus was not unexpected at all. In fact, you can say that it was pre-planned. October 18th, 2019. Event 201 begins. The outcome of the CAPS pandemic in event 201 was catastrophic. 65 million people died in the first 18 months. The outbreak was small at first and initially seemed controllable, but then it started spreading in densely crowded and impoverished neighborhoods of megacities. From that point on, the spread of the disease was explosive. Within six months, cases were occurring in nearly every country. It began in healthy-looking pigs, months, perhaps years ago. A new coronavirus spread silently within herds. Gradually, farmers started getting sick. Infected people got a respiratory illness with symptoms ranging from mild flu-like signs to severe pneumonia. The sickest required intensive care. Many died. Experts agree, unless it is quickly controlled, it could lead to a severe pandemic, an outbreak that circles the globe and affects people everywhere. Event 201 was a simulated global disaster, a pandemic featuring none other than the coronavirus we are currently seeing all over the news. If you go to the website centerforhealthsecurity.org slash event 201, you can read all about this event and what it was designed to accomplish. And that's exactly what we are going to do today. This is taken from their website about the Event 201 exercise. Event 201 was a three and a half hour pandemic tabletop exercise that simulated a series of dramatic, scenario-based facilitated discussions confronting difficult, true-to-life dilemmas associated with response to a hypothetical but scientifically plausible pandemic. Fifteen global businesses, governments, and public health leaders were players in the simulation exercise that highlighted unresolved real-world policy and economic issues that could be solved with sufficient political will, financial investments, and attention now and in the future. The exercise consisted of pre-recorded news broadcasts, live staff briefings, and moderated discussions on specific topics. These issues were carefully designed in a compelling narrative that educated the participants and the audience. The Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security, World Economic Forum, and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation jointly propose these recommendations. We'll get into the recommendation page in just a minute. So let's look at the scenario page. The title of this page is The Event 201 Scenario. Event 201 simulates an outbreak of a novel zoonotic coronavirus transmitted from bats to pigs to people that eventually becomes efficiently transmissible from person to person, leading to a severe pandemic. The pathogen and the disease it causes are modeled largely on SARS, but it is more transmissible in the community setting by people with mild symptoms. The disease starts in pig farms in Brazil, quietly and slowly at first, but then it starts to spread more rapidly in healthcare settings. When it starts to spread efficiently from person to person in the low-income and densely packed neighborhoods of some of the megacities in South America, the epidemic explodes. It is first exported by air travel to Portugal, the United States, and China, and then to many other countries. Although the first countries are able to control it, it continues to spread and be reintroduced, and eventually no country can maintain control. 
there is no possibility of vaccine being available in the first year. There is a fictional antiviral drug that can help the sick but not significantly limit the spread of the disease. Since the whole human population is susceptible, during the initial months of the pandemic, the cumulative number of cases increases exponentially, doubling every week. And as the cases and deaths accumulate, the economic and societal consequences become increasingly severe. The scenario ends at the 18-month point with 65 million deaths. The pandemic is beginning to slow due to the decreasing number of susceptible people. The pandemic will continue at some rate until there is an effective vaccine or until 80 or 90% of the global population has been exposed. From that point on, it is likely to be an endemic childhood disease. 65 million deaths and they don't expect it to stop until 80 to 90% of the global population has been exposed. This is a direct quote from their own website. As we just heard from the Event 201 simulation website, this pandemic was simulated to kick off in South America. However, we now know that this virus originated in the city of Wuhan, China. And it cannot be a coincidence that Wuhan, China is home to two of the country's top secret biowarfare programs. According to the Washington Times, quote, virus hit Wuhan has two laboratories linked to Chinese biowarfare programs. The Virology Institute there has China's only secure lab for studying deadly viruses, end quote. Next section is the purpose section. In recent years, the world has seen a growing number of epidemic events, accounting to approximately 200 events annually. These events are increasing and they are disruptive to health, economies, and society. Managing these events already strains global capacity, even absent a pandemic threat. Experts agree that it is only a matter of time before one of these epidemics becomes global, a pandemic with potentially catastrophic consequences, a severe pandemic which becomes Event 201, would require reliable cooperation among several industries, national governments, and key international institutions. Recent economic studies show that pandemics will be the cause of an average annual economic loss of $570 billion. The players' responses to the scenario illuminated the need for cooperation among the industry, national governments, key international institutions, and civil society to avoid the catastrophic consequences that could arise from such a large-scale pandemic. Similar to the center's three previous exercises named Clade X, Dark Winter, and Atlantic Storm. Event 201 aimed to educate senior leaders at the highest level of U.S. and international governments and leaders in the global industries. It is also a tool to inform members of the policy and preparedness communities and the general public. This is distinct from many other forms of simulation exercises that test protocols or technical policies of a specific organization. Exercises similar to Event 201 are an effective way to help policymakers gain a fuller understanding of the urgent challenges they could face in a dynamic real-world crisis. A call to action. The next severe pandemic will not only cause great illness and loss of life, but could also trigger major cascading economic and societal consequences that could contribute greatly to global impact and suffering. Efforts to prevent such consequences or respond to them as they unfold will require unprecedented levels of collaboration between governments, international organizations, and the private sector. There have been important efforts to engage the private sector in epidemic and outbreak preparedness at the national or regional levels. However, there are major unmet global vulnerabilities and international system challenges posed by pandemics that will require new, robust forms of public and private cooperation to address. The Event 201 pandemic exercise conducted on October 18, 2019 vividly demonstrated a number of these important gaps in pandemic preparedness 
as well as some of the elements of the solutions between the public and private sectors that will be needed to fill them. The Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security, the World Economic Forum, and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation jointly propose the following. Number one, governments, international organizations, and businesses should plan now for how essential corporate capabilities will be utilized during large-scale pandemic. During a severe pandemic, public sector efforts to control the outbreak are likely to become overwhelmed, but industry assets, if swiftly and appropriately deployed, could help save lives and reduce economic losses. For instance, companies with operations focused on logistics, social media, or distribution systems will be needed to enable government's emergency response, risk communications, and medical countermeasure distributions during a pandemic. This includes working together to ensure that strategic commodities are available and accessible for public health response. Contingency planning for a potential operational partnership between government and businesses will be complex, with many legal and organizational details to be addressed. Governments should work now to identify the most critical areas of need and reach out to global industry players with the goal of finalizing agreements in advance of the next large pandemic. The Global Preparedness Monitoring Board would be well positioned to help monitor and contribute to the efforts that governments, international organizations, and businesses should take for pandemic preparedness response. Number two, industry, national governments, and international organizations should work together to enhance internationally held stockpiles of medical countermeasures to manage rapid and equitable distribution during a severe pandemic. The World Health Organization currently has an influenza vaccine virtual stockpile with contracts in place with pharmaceutical companies that have agreed to supply vaccines should the World Health Organization request them. As one possible approach, this virtual stockpile model could be expanded to augment the WHO's ability to distribute vaccines and therapeutics to countries in the greatest need. One possible approach, this virtual stockpile model could be expanded to augment the WHO's ability to distribute vaccines and therapeutics to countries in the greatest need during a severe pandemic. This should also include any available experimental vaccine stockpiles for any WHO R&D blueprint pathogens to deploy in a critical trial during outbreaks in collaboration with CEPI, GAVI, and WHO. Other approaches could involve regional stockpiles or multinational agreements. During a catastrophic outbreak, countries may be reluctant to part with scarce medical resources. A robust international stockpile could therefore help to ensure that low and middle resource settings receive needed supplies regardless of whether they produce such supplies domestically. Countries with national supplies or domestic manufacturing capabilities should commit to donating some supplies or products to this virtual stockpile. Countries should support this effort through the provision of additional funding. Number three. Countries, international organizations, and global transportation companies should work together to maintain travel and trade during a severe pandemic. Travel and trade are essential to the global economy as well as to national and even local economies, and they should be maintained even in the face of a pandemic. Improved decision-making coordination and communications between the public and private sectors relating to risk, travel advisories, import-export restrictions and border measures will be needed. Fear and uncertainty experienced during past outbreaks, even those limited to a national or regional level, have sometimes led to unjustified border measures, the closure of customer-facing businesses, import bans, and the cancellation of airline flights and international shipping. A particularly fast-moving and lethal pandemic could therefore result in political decisions to slow or stop the movement of people and goods, potentially harming economies already vulnerable in the face of an outbreak. Ministries of Health and other governmental agencies should work together now with international airlines and global shipping 
companies to develop realistic response scenarios and start a contingency planning process with the goal of mitigating economic damage by maintaining key travel and trade routes during a large-scale pandemic. Supporting continued trade and travel in such an extreme circumstance may require the provision of enhanced disease control measures and personal protective equipment for transportation workers, government subsidies, and potentially liability protection in certain cases. International organizations including the WHO, the International Air Transport Association, and the International Civil Aviation Organization should be partners in these preparedness and response efforts. Number four. Governments should provide more resources and support for the development and surge of manufacturing vaccines, therapeutics, and diagnostics that will be needed during a severe pandemic. In the event of a severe pandemic, countries may need population-level supplies of safe and effective medical countermeasures, including vaccines, therapeutics, and diagnostics. Therefore, the ability to rapidly dissolve, manufacture, distribute, and disperse large quantities of MCMs will be needed to contain and control a global outbreak. Countries with enough resources should greatly increase this capacity. In coordination with the WHO, CEPI, and GAVI, and other relevant multilateral and domestic mechanisms that will allow concomitant distributed manufacturing. This will require addressing legal and regulatory barriers, among other issues. Number five. Global business should recognize the economic burden of pandemics and fight for stronger preparedness. In addition to investing more and preparing their own companies and industries, business leaders and their shareholders should actively engage with governments and advocate for increased resources for pandemic preparedness. Globally, there has been a lack of attention and investment in preparing for high-impact pandemics, and business is largely not involved in existing efforts. To a significant extent, this is due to the lack of awareness of the business risk posed by a pandemic. Tools should be built that help large private sector companies visualize business risks posed by infectious disease and pathways to mitigate risk through public-private cooperation to strengthen preparedness. A severe pandemic would greatly interfere with workforce health, business operations, and the movement of goods and services. A catastrophic level outbreak can also have profound and long-lasting effects on entire industries, the economy, and societies in which businesses operate. While governments and public health authorities serve as the first line of defense against fast-moving outbreaks, their efforts are chronically underfunded and lack sustained support. Global business leaders should play a far more dynamic role as advocates with a stake in stronger pandemic preparedness. Number six, international organizations should prioritize reducing economic impacts of epidemics and pandemics. Much of the economic harm resulting from a pandemic is likely to be due to counter productive behavior of individuals, companies, and countries. For example, actions that lead to disruption of travel and trade or that change consumer behavior can greatly damage economies. In addition to other response activities, an increase in and reassessment of pandemic financial support will certainly be needed in a severe pandemic, as many sectors of society may need financial support during or after a severe pandemic, including healthcare institutions, essential businesses, and national governments. Furthermore, the ways in which these existing funds can now be used are limited. The international health regulations prioritize both minimizing public health risks and avoiding unnecessary interference with international traffic and trade, but there will also be a need to identify critical nodes of the banking system and global and national economies that are too essential to fail. There are some that are likely to need emergency international financial support as well. The World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, regional development banks, national governments, foundations, and others should increase the amount and availability of funds in a pandemic and ensure that they can be flexible and used where needed. Number seven, the final and the most important recommendation. Governments and private sectors should assign a greater priority to developing methods to combat mis- and disinformation prior to the next 
post-pandemic response. Governments will need to partner with traditional and social media companies to research and develop nimble approaches to countering misinformation. This will require developing the ability to flood media fast with accurate and consistent information. Public health authorities should work with private employers and trusted community leaders, such as faith leaders, to promulgate factual information to employees and citizens. Trusted, influential private sector employers should create the capacity to readily and reliably augment public messaging, manage rumors and misinformation, and amplify credible information to support emergency public communications. National public health agencies should work in close collaboration with the WHO to create the capability to rapidly develop and release consistent health messages. For their part, media companies should commit to ensuring that authoritative messages are prioritized and that false messages are suppressed, including through the use of technology. And then they go on to say, accomplishing the above goals will require collaboration among governments, international organizations, and global businesses. If these recommendations are robustly pursued, major progress can be made to diminish the potential impact and consequences of pandemics. We call on leaders in global business international organizations and national governments to launch an ambitious effort to work together and build a world better prepared for a severe pandemic. Everything we just read can be seen as fictional. It may read as a science fiction book or movie, but in fact it is a very real scenario that may lead to a widespread global disaster. But we should not be scared. We should not fear this. Why? Because the Bible tells us, quote, you will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, the plague that stalks in the darkness, or the calamity that destroys at noon. Though a thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, no harm will come to you. 